South Africans find themselves in the dark most nights. Our old friend load shedding, uh, much like potholes and cable theft, crime and corruption has become quintessentially part of life in South Africa. What's worse, ESCOM tells us we're headed for over 100 days of load shedding as we plunge into the winter months. It's a depressing subject, but helping to shed some light on the subject, pun intended. On the history of this energy crisis and the nuclear deal, we came oh so close um, to tying ourselves into is legal journalist, analyst, and author Karen Morn. Ms. Morn, it's great to chat to you. Thanks for gifting some of your time between legal cases. Welcome. Thank you, Mike. It's, it's amazing speaking to you. I want to begin by setting the scene for our discussion. I'm going to quote from your book. We are in this dire situation for a number of reasons, not least of all because of the government's obsession with environmentally disastrous and inefficient coal power stations. We are also here because for the nine years during which he was in office, Ramaphosa's predecessor, President Jacob Zuma, pushed for a financially suicidal nuclear deal with Russia without any coherent strategy for how such a deal would be financed. Karen, uh, well done on the book. It will stand as a text documenting just how close we came to absolute financial ruin for generations to come. We did step back off the ledge. Uh, in a nutshell, for somebody who knows absolutely nothing about the nuclear deal, what is it? What was it? Uh, and what was the price tag envisioned to be for the taxpayer? Well, I think one has to understand um, the nuclear deal as a kind of collision of, of the former President Jacob Zuma's geopolitical ambitions, his personal anxiety and paranoia, and his refusal to understand that um, accountability mechanisms utilized against him were not, as he believed, the consequence of some um, nefarious political and uh, economic plot, but were just, you know, the, the reasonable... Um, kind of accountability mechanisms required of any executive um, in his possession. And then also, um, of course, the convergence of those geopolitical ambitions about, you know, his friendship with his, with his quote, close friend, quote unquote, Vladimir Putin, with, with the state capture project. So if we had to sort of, in a nutshell term, what the nuclear deal was, it was the largest attempted act of state capture that the Zuma administration tried and failed to push through because of the courage of a number of officials, um, many of them from Treasury, but also in the Energy Department. Very smart litigation. Um, and, and also, of course, you know, the, the people, the men and women who were prepared within civil society to continue to hold the line. Um, but, you know, it, it was price tag was around one trillion rand and Tlantla Nene, who I spoke to last week, actually saying that it was probably far more than that. But more damagingly, Michael, we would have been in a scenario where we were essentially dependent on Russia for 23 percent of our power um, in circumstances where that would have obviously had both fin profound financial implications in terms of electricity tariffs for ordinary consumers but also profound geopolitical implications, which are already playing themselves out in the Ukraine situation. You can't speak about Zuma's plans to tie us into what, have, what would have been the most expensive infrastructure build program in our country's history with the Russians without considering, as you say, his viewpoint on other parts of the world, the, the West mainly. He's not a big fan of the West. Why is that? Well, essentially what the book explains is that this agreement, this nuclear project that the ANC was intent on pursuing had been, you know, very much in the offing for a while. And even Tabo and Becky had tried to, you know, be behind a particular deal either with Arriba or Westinghouse, um, the French and, and um, American uh, nuclear agencies. But Zuma's nuclear deal sort of came into existence in 2014 you know, I think a matter of days after he received treatment, um, healing treatment for what he contended was an attempted poisoning by the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, so Zuma believed that Barack Obama's administration was intent on his demise. And you and I both sat through the state capture inquiry. Um, you actually far more than me. You know the evidence that was led. But we both know when Jacob Zuma arrived to testify there in July 2019, 
his evidence was predominated by this narrative that he had been the victim of a three decade long plot orchestrated against him by nefarious apartheid spies and Western foreign Western um, intelligence agencies. And he literally articulated it that every single issue that he had, even the commission itself, was somehow embedded in this, you know, desire to not only kill him. I mean, we heard bizarre allegations about, you know, a suicide bomber at a Muscandi conference for a concert, for example, but also to what he said, obliterate him, remove him politically from the scene. And, you know, when we understand the attacks that people like Ntlatlanene, Pavan Gordon, um, Lungisa Fuzile and others, this narrative that has become so popular, it's embedded within our culture even now. Basically, anyone who was doing their job, upholding the constitutional prescripts of what procurement should be, wasn't seen as a legitimate voice of reason who was asking appropriate questions. They were seen by Zuma and those aligned to him as being agents or spies of the apartheid regime or of the West, or both. Now, somebody whose uh, voice your your book or your book gives a voice to is an extraordinary amount of detail that you give from your interviews with Nompumalelo and Tuli Zuma. Um, who is she and what is she or what did she stand accused of? Well, Mpumalelo and Tuli Zuma, my and Tuli, as she's colloquially known, was the person who was identified by the state security agency as the person that had been recruited by the CIA to poison Zuma. And, you know, the, the allegations are so bizarre, you know, that the poison was sewn in the hems of dresses and, you know, the CIA had literally, you know, recruited this rural Zulu woman, mother of two, um, you know, to become this nefarious agent of death for Jacob Zuma. Um, and I mean, the, the, the allegations are so bizarre that, you know, on some point you want to laugh, particularly when you hear about Russian trained, you know, the Russian trained toxicologists um, you know, finding their only real achievement during their five years, you know, treating or looking after or, or Zuma was discovering expired cool drinks in his pantry. But she is, she is, you know, the tragic human center of the story because for five years she was accused of being a poisoning mastermind. She and her children were thrown out of Nkandla. They moved from guest house to guest house. She talks about coming to the brink of suicide and telling the minister at the time, David McLaughlin, that she won't kill herself, even though she believes that's what they want her to do. And, you know, imagine in her context, the, the stories that she tells about being woken up in the middle of the night, attached to a lie detector machine by SSA agents. Um, you and I, again, this all came before the state capture inquiry. And it really is an illustration of how people caught in the crosshairs of Jacob Zuma's um, bizarre narcissistic delusions, um, you know, suffered. Uh, some of them lost their jobs. Some of them were, um, you know, forced out of positions that they held for years. But she, as his, as his estranged wife, was placed in a position where she was falsely accused of an attempted murder that she had no part in, and which actually there appears to be no evidence of at all. For all the faults of, of South Africa, there are certain departments and individuals um, who stood as, as bulwarks against the tide of, of corruption and, and downright terrible government policy decisions. How important was the role of National Treasury and the role of people like Lungisa Fuzile and Tlantla Nene? How important was the role that they played? I think Treasury held the line. And I think that it came at great cost to them. And I, at one point, I interviewed Kenneth Brown, who's the former chief procurement officer in Treasury. And he speaks about how, it, how important it is for there to be a relationship of trust between the president and the finance minister. And he speaks about the relationship between uh, then President Thabo Mbeki, who we know had many of his faults, own faults, and um, Finance Minister Trevor Manuel, who was in that position for 12 years. I mean, it's hard to fathom, given that, you know, we saw that quick succession four in a row um, under the Zuma administration. 
And what he essentially said was when there isn't that trust and the president doesn't trust Treasury to make the right responsible decisions with state money that's going to take the country forward, it's going to be massively destructive. And that's essentially what happened because Treasury were constantly the adults in the room. Um, you know, and I mean, I interviewed Jacob Zuma about the nuclear deal, and he was very adamant that had it been done, we would have, you know, instead of it costing us trillions or a trillion rand, we would make, you know, we would make trillions and trillions, and we'd be so economically um, in a much better position, et cetera, et cetera. But that doesn't look at the fact that, you know, there were real question marks over how exactly Russia would fund this what the geopolitical implications be, would be. And would we see, as we do in Egypt, for example, where Rosa Tom did conclude um, a nuclear deal with the Egyptian government, a situation where nuclear bill just keeps being stalled um, because Russia doesn't actually have the financial incentive to make that build a reality. Um, I think that we you know, speculate quite strongly that if this deal had been concluded, there was a very real possibility that we would have waited um, for many, many years for that bill to be concluded, if in fact it ever was. And the thing with Treasury was they were the ones that were constantly saying, how is this going to be financed? What are the implications for us financially? Where are we going to get the money? Is this feasible? Um, and at points, you know, along the way, when it became apparent, um, when Mene was placed under huge pressure to sign a letter that he believed would have been a guarantee to the Russian state the Treasury would intervene if we couldn't pay back the money. Um, you know, they, they actually said, like, even if we did a 2.5 gigawatt deal, we just simply could not afford it. And that was in 2015. We now sit in an economic crisis point where, had we done that deal, what would the actual implications for us be now? So... As you've mentioned, it was you, not your co-author, Kirsten Pearson, who interviewed Jacob Zuma. How does go, one go about getting an interview with Ubaba? How long did that take to set up and, and what was it like? Well, essentially, I mean, I have my own theories about why he gave it. But I, you know, I was talking to um, the people around him at the time. And I'd done a lot of work covering his case. And I was really... No, he hadn't really spoken about the nuclear deal. So my thing was, I want to hear from him about what his stance on that was. And I don't know why he gave the interview, but part of me, Michael, suspects that in the wake of, you know, there's, there are real question marks about, you know, whether the ANC received money, if people received money in order to make this deal a reality, um, there has been the betrayal of the Promise Report in 2017 that said the ANC got 100 million rand. Certainly the officials within Treasury and other departments I spoke to were very much of the belief that there was a financial imperative. I thought that possibly one of the reasons that he did that, um, that, he did that interview was to make it clear to Russia, and specifically to Vladimir Putin, who he said was his friend, that the deal not happening was not something that he had not pushed for. Um, and certainly in terms of the, the way in which he was overly um, deferential to Russia and it's, you know, what it had done for South Africa and his deep commitment to the Russian government and to a shared nuclear project and to BRICS, um, et cetera. I think that there was a real reason perhaps why he agreed to do that in terms of cementing his loyalties and making clear that he was not the person responsible for that deal not happening. What's he like off camera? Deeply charismatic, as one suspects? He's a very charming man, um, very affable, very friendly. Um, you know, he's a, one of the things that we have in common is that we're both diabetic. He's a type 2, I'm a type 1. And so, he, you know, he's very careful with what he eats and his blood sugar and, you know, I have covered his stories for many years and there's such a discrepancy between what he's like in person, but what he's prepared to say under oath in court processes and the way in which increasingly he's prepared to like eviscerate um, his political enemies in the, in the cut and thrust of political and legal discourse. But as a human being, and it was very apparent, you know, his wife was there, one of his wives were there, his 
teenage, some of his teenage daughters were there. He clearly, you know, was very loved and cared for by his family. And I think that's, that's there's, there's a clear reason why in 2007 he was elected as the ANC's um, president. In circumstances where he was facing corruption charges, he'd just been acquitted on a rape case. Um, he was sort of not seen by many people as the kind of person that would regain, would get leadership of the ANC. But he did it because on many levels, he's a political straight street fighter. And on many others, he's very, very good at convincing people of his sincerity and, and the fact that, you know, they want to work with him in order to, to kind of um, seek an alignment there. So, yeah, it was fascinating, but, you know, definitely the end of his life now at age 80, facing 25 years in prison and in increasingly resorting to desperate litigation to avoid his trial from ever happening. Um, given what he did, given the fact that he went to prison, was part of the ANC, um, it's immensely sad. Uh, we'll we'll get to to where his corruption trial is at in a second. I just want to ask about one interesting character you interviewed and you gave a voice to Tina Jomat Peterson, the former energy minister. She's had a bad rap, um, fairly or unfairly so, for being a Gupta lackey and and kind of the face behind this uh, nuclear deal in a sense. I get the impression she has tried to rebrand herself um, and and almost saying, quote, she put hurdles to the nuclear deal in place, um, maybe hurdles that weren't apparent to the public. She remains a, a controversial character, doesn't she? No, absolutely. I mean, we know what happened with the Strategic um, Energy Fund, the oil reserves. Uh, you know, Sophie, while she was in the position as Minister of um, Forestry and Fisheries, the IFBAL survey, Sekunjalo um, situation that she was with, public protector, Tuli Madanzela made very damaging findings against her. But one of the interesting things is that, you know, people within Treasury and the Energy Department both said to myself and Kirsten, like, don't write her off as, as a Gupta bot. Because I think that even, you know, people that are compromised, you know, like, for instance, Malusi Gagaba, uh, could see that this thing was an absolute disaster. I mean, when he was put in as finance minister, when when things got pretty desperate, he made it clear, like, you know, we have to do things at a scale, um, scale and pace that is affordable to the country. But she, you know, and even the DA shadow minister of energy actually said to me that, you know, she had, um, in terms of the draft IRP in 2016, which kicked nuclear down the road, in terms of putting that intergovernmental agreement with Russia before Parliament so it could be legally challenged um, in terms of stopping the energy department officials who were trying to procure nuclear unlawfully through so-called vendor parades. She did, in her own way, put up blockages. And she, while not going into detail, has claimed to have suffered immensely adverse consequences as a result of that. Of course, people are going to greet that with skepticism, and they are going to say, well, this is an attempt at rebranding. But I found it very interesting that people like McKay, like people within the Treasury and the Energy Department, were, in fact, quite supportive of her and said that they didn't believe in respect of nuclear, at least. She had got a fair rap. You know, it's terrifying at one point to read about people in the Department of Energy who were prepared to massage the numbers. Uh, we sometimes think of government as sort of one coherent uh, block. But there's a lot of infighting that goes on between the departments, Treasury and the DOE in this case. Um, in writing this book, I am deeply skeptical individual. I think years in journalism has, has taught me that. I, I have an internal fight to remain positive. Um, we come. We come from the same industry. It can be draining. Um, how do you? How do you remain positive? What What sentiment has writing this book left you with? I think one of the the best aspects of the book was interviewing Makoma Lakalakala and Liz McDade from Safse and Earth Life Africa, who are two middle aged women who 
basically with the assistant of, assistance of Dad, um, advocate David Unterhalter, bought incredibly smart litigation that basically shut that deal down. And the litigation was so clever because it sort of slipped under the radar um, because it was highly technical. It was about the legality of the intergovernmental agreement between South Africa and Russia. It was about the so-called Section 34 determination that allowed, then subsequently allowed ESCOM to procure nuclear energy on behalf of government, attacking that and saying there wasn't public participation. And then as a consequence of, of basically having all those things set aside, effectively blocking ESCOM, then under the leadership of Machela Koko, Anaj Singh and others, very pro-Gupta, highly captured and corrupted individuals, allegedly, um, you know, it's it stopped them from being able to to push that nuclear deal through in the in the last and dying moments of the Zuma presidency. And you know, when uh, Makoma, for example, said to me, "We learned from the nuclear deal. We learned that you can't be asking questions because these guys will make." the deal goes through and you'll be like, what the hell just happened? Um, and they came and they were threatened. People, you know, she said that someone phoned her and said, who's the white person behind you? Um, you know, which was, I think, this kind of tragic thing was that any, you know, any people who sort of stood up were accused of being puppets of white people. And we see... We see that kind of narrative perpetuating itself now in the words of someone like Lindiwe Sisulu who calls black judges puppets of white masters. And that's a very deliberate narrative and it's designed to isolate people who make decisions that are in the best interest of the country, who fight for the constitution, who fight for rule of law. And I think that, you know, McCormick and Liz showed me that this belief that we have that we're insignificant and we can't do anything is actually deeply untrue because they they shut the nuclear deal down. But they also prove that it's very important for us now to fight to defend our courts, to fight to defend our judiciary, to fight to defend rule of law, because there's an adverse pro project that is really going on right now and um, from many high level people within the NC, but I mean, I would argue from, from former president Jacob Zuma to some degree, the public protector, um, et cetera, to, to undermine the courts. And if that happens, we really are in, going to be in a, in a far more precarious position than we are now. Um, and we have to keep defending them and call people out when they, when they basically make uh, adverse baseless and unsubstantiated allegations against the judiciary. I imagine one of the hardest parts of writing a book is, is not what you put in, but, but what you have to leave out. Is there anything that got cut that you wish could have stayed in? Well, there was one aspect that you know was removed because at the time it wasn't thought to be relevant. But for example, um, there was a lot of information about how Russian intelligence had met with David and Matlobo. It was around 2015 and discussed so-called color revolutions which is essentially what Russia accused Ukraine of doing. Now, color revolution is when, according to them, Western forces uh, foment uh, conflict or, or uprisings against um, the state, the status quo, because of pursuing their own agendas, their nefarious Western agendas. And so they framed Ukraine's, um, you know, anti-Russia kind of stance as in those terms. Um, and I found that that was, and then, you know, the color revolution was essentially what Zuma subsequently accuses Gordon of in 20s, you know, when he fires him, says basically that Gordon and, and Nkobisi Jonas had gone to the US and, and, and um, the UK to, to kind of get support for an economic coup against South Africa. Um, and I found, you know, I, I think that there's, there's definitely something there. And I think that, you know, we have seen profound evidence of potential foreign intelligence um, involvement in our social media spaces, in, in the release of so fake, fake intelligence reports, in the hacking of people's emails, etc. And while we, we, we look at that, we look at particular instances, um, I've, I think that there's a real, there's profound evidence that there was active intervention by the Russian state 
in our intelligence agencies and that that actually may be continuing and probably is continuing even to this day. Lastly, it would be remiss of me not to ask about Jacob Zuma and the arms deal corruption trial. Do you see 2022 coming and going without getting any closer to finality? What's the what's the, the current state of play? Well, it's been delayed so that um, the Supreme Court of Appeal, President Mandisa Maya, can make a decision on Jacob Zuma's application for reconsideration of that court's dismissal of his... Um, attempt to appeal the dismissal of his special plea, which of course was where he attacks Billy Dahmer and says that he lacks the independence and impartiality to prosecute him, must be removed from the case, and that he must, as a result thereof, be acquitted, which just seems to be an argument that he wavers on. Um, and essentially, you know, saying that he shouldn't be allowed to just bring these kind of appeals and stall his case ad nauseum. Judge Pitkun uh, disagreed with that. The state says that they, they believe that he may have not, not be correct on that issue. But it became apparent in the court hearing yesterday that the Billy Downer is hoping that when, when either the SCA or the Con Court, um, if and when they do dismiss Zuma's latest application, that will effectively endorse what Kuhn said right at the beginning in that dismissing the special plea. And he said simply that you can't bring these kind of appeals prior to conviction. Um, and and Dana is of the view that if the courts dismiss Zuma's, Zuma's application, that ruling must and should stand. Uh, part of me, in a way, would hope even though there is no case to be made by Jacob Zuma, I don't think he has made a case, that perhaps the Constitutional Court does turn around and say, well, hear this, and they make it very clear that you can't appeal um, at this point in a trial, that you can't bring these applications. Because Dana is right. If we don't have a clear legal line drawn in the sand, we are going to be in circumstances where we see ourselves now with the public protector seeking a rescission of the dismissal of a rescission and the former president withstanding a due call for him to go on trial for corruption for years to come using um, litigation and baseless appeals to basically stay the processes against him. Yeah, what he's done is, is provide a playbook to every single dodgy bugger um, out there who's going to use the very same tactics that he has uh, successfully used for the better half of two decades to not have his day in court, despite um, his appeals that that is all that he wants. Karen Morn, thank you for your time and thank you for the work that you do. Thank you, Mike Apple.